This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Hey team, how are we doing? Welcome to the Crypto Conversation. I know in my audience, I've got a lot of uh, different types of people. We've got executives, uh, business owners, crypto traders, tech entrepreneurs. And if that is you, then no doubt you are juggling competing priorities all day, every day. Ever feel like your brain is being pulled in a million different directions? And to make matters worse, you can be often sabotaged by a whole heap of interruptions. Yeah, I know how you feel. Some days you just feel totally frustrated because it feels like you're stuck in first gear and redlining for hours at a time. What can you do to break free and accelerate to the next level? Well, Elon Musk's Neuralink, I mean, that's on the way, but mm, probably a long way off. Luckily, folks, there is a safe and effective solution that is available right now and they are a new sponsor here at the crypto conversation i'm talking about newtopia newtopia was created to help high achievers like you break through barriers and achieve more faster than you ever thought possible newtopia offers a variety of nootropic stacks designed to boost memory cognitive function and energy levels taking the right formulas at the right times can help you focus block out distractions reduce stress and anxiety and enhance your creativity and you'll be amazed by how quickly they work you can feel the mental effects within just 15 to 30 minutes plus what's really cool about Nootopia is every stack was formulated by a man who is described as the most advanced brain chemist and nootropics formulator alive today secondly every formula is customized for you based on your strengths weaknesses and goals so you get exactly what you need how much is one hour of your time worth? What if you could reclaim five hours of productive time every week? Would that have an impact on your bottom line? Well, Newtopia's formulas are a total game changer. And they also come with a full one-year guarantee. So there's zero risk for you if you want to try them out. So ready to upgrade your brain? Simply go to newtopia.com forward slash crypto and use the code crypto 10 that's crypto 10 to receive 10 percent off any order and again the website is newtopia that's n-o-o-t-o-p-i-a dot com forward slash crypto and the code crypto 10 or crypto 10 all right let's get on with the show <laughs> my guest today is yosef titek yosef is a brand ambassador and Bitcoin analyst at Satoshi Labs and Trezor. Uh, so yeah, very interesting. Uh, Yosef uh, says here is a long time Bitcoiner with a background in Austrian economics and political philosophy. Fascinating. Welcome to the show, uh, Yosef. Hi. Thanks uh, for the for the invitation. You are very welcome. So, yeah, look, at hey, uh, well, I've said uh, a little bit in, in, in your intro. So you're a, an ambassador and analyst at Satoshi Labs, um, who I believe make uh, the very famous hardware wallet uh, known as Trezor. Uh, and I know uh, you're a, uh, yeah, a longtime Bitcoiner and a Bitcoin writer and author. So excited to uh, learn all about you today. But look, getting ahead of ourselves, I uh, love it if you could please introduce yourself uh yosef just love to hear a little bit about your um personal story um yeah and the lead up to uh what you're doing now yeah sure so i'm from uh the czech republic where uh satoshi labs and trezor is based and uh yeah like you said i have an economics background uh mostly austrian economics and i had a good luck uh to learn about uh, this school of economics during my university studies. So I've been an, uh, into Austrian economics for more than 10 years since uh, even before I discovered Bitcoin. Uh, and it nicely merged uh, after I discovered Bitcoin, uh, like this uh, idea of sound money and uh, the separation of money and state and Bitcoin, of course, uh, uh, it's uh, perfectly merges. So uh, throughout the years, I authored uh, two books. Uh, one is on Bitcoin. It's called uh, Bitcoin Separation of Money and State. Uh, and the other one is more 
uh, of a political philosophy. Uh, it's called Enemies of State, Friends of Liberty. And in that book, I basically cover the lives and works of 27 notable uh, economists, libertarians, uh, entrepreneurs. Above both of these books are in Czech for now. But the Bitcoin book is going to be uh, translated into um, English and Spanish uh, through the Brains Publishing. Uh, if you know Brains, like the mining company, they have also like a publishing arm. So they are nice enough to uh, translate my book into English. So maybe in a, like six months, it's going to be out in English as well. Yeah. And um, so what I do in Trezor as a Bitcoin analyst slash uh, ambassador is I basically explore like the consequences of Bitcoin from the economic uh, perspective, like uh, how hyper Bitcoinization is going to happen, how people adopt Bitcoin right now in various countries around the world. And for example, uh, part of that is uh, I run uh, Twitter spaces uh, for Trezor. These Twitter spaces are called Fiat Free and uh, it's usually once every two weeks. And I always invite people from some specific country, for example, Venezuela or Argentina, or next week we, we are going to cover Nigeria. And we always uh, go deep into uh, what are the nuances of Bitcoin adoption in the given country. And it's uh, very, uh, very enlightening and very interesting to learn about how Bitcoin is used, for example, in uh, South African townships. So yeah, it's um, very exciting and I recommend everyone to just uh, join in sometimes. And we are actually turning this uh, Twitter space into podcast soon. So uh, it could be found in, in a near future. It can be found uh, in like Spotify and stuff. Oh, fantastic. Well, uh, I wish you all the best with that endeavor. We can never have uh, too many uh, Bitcoin podcasts. And um, yeah, I mean, Yosef, I, I, I've been reading a, a, a couple of your pieces and, you know, you uh, talked about the uh, the Bitcoin hyper-Bitcoinization hyper piece. I think that's called the hyper-Bitcoinized uh, world. And uh, there was another one I read, uh, Bitcoin, the conservative choice. So uh, we can, we'll come back and maybe use those two as, uh, because I thought they were, yeah, they're both good pieces to your most recent pieces. So I picked out a, a couple of good points uh, for discussion out of those. But I'm interested, uh, Yosef, you know, um, I, I, you know, Bitcoin famously has um, this uh, sound money ethos, right? And that is um, often associated uh, with Austrian economics. But, you know, Austrian economics is quite a, it's definitely a smaller uh, school of economics, if you like. And you would be, uh, you know, there wouldn't be that many people that come from an Austrian economics background uh, before they've even, uh, you know, heard heard of or, or encountered Bitcoin. I'm not saying that's exactly how it worked for you, but uh, I guess I, what I am saying is how did it work for you? So when when did you begin to learn about Bitcoin and what was that like for you uh, as you kind of came to realize or view Bitcoin with that sound money lens uh, with all the kind of that, that knowledge behind you already? All right. Yeah. So let me uh, walk you through like my... Uh... Uh, history of like learning about stuff. <laughs> so uh, I've been studying uh, or I studied uh, university between the years 2009, 2011. That was the University of Economics in Prague. And like I said, I had a good luck for, uh, for teachers who were uh, focused on the Austrian School of Economics. Sometimes in Czech Republic, we sort of joke around that the Austrian School of Economics is nowadays more like a Czech School of Economics because a lot of the so-called Austrians are actually Czechs. Uh, so yeah, it's quite popular in Czech Republic, probably more popular than in uh, most other countries. Uh, and in between these years, 2009, 2011, uh, I didn't know anything about Bitcoin. Uh, I only studied like the Austrian School of Economics and uh, of course, Mario Rothbard and Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek, they always uh, like mention, like they first analyze what's wrong with uh, the fiat money, what's wrong with like uh, central bank manipulating the interest rates. Uh, 
and uh, having like the monopoly on money, pro money production and the whole Cantillon effect stuff and Austrian business cycle theory. And then they usually follow that up with, uh, we need to go back to the sound money uh, paradigm, which like used to be gold the gold and silver standards, right? Uh, so in between these years, I've been quite a uh, fierce believer in returning to the gold standard, but of course uh, we would need uh, a cooperation from the government and the central bank to get back to like the gold standard. And there were of course uh, attempts at uh, returning to the gold standard uh, bottom up, like uh, there was the Liberty Dollar project, uh, but it never ended good uh, because the government always stepped in and basically arrested uh, the founders of such projects. So I first heard about Bitcoin uh, around uh, 2011, 2012. Uh, there was a Bitcoiner on uh, on the EconTalk podcast, uh, which was run by, uh, or I believe it still is, uh, by uh, one of the Austrian economists. And I thought it was interesting, but I didn't pay that much attention. Like. That's usually the case. Uh, when you first heard about Bitcoin, you don't really care. Uh, and but then it's sort of like it was always uh, in the back of my mind. Like uh, maybe we don't have to return to the gold standard to have a sound money again. Maybe uh, there's something else. So around the years like 2015, 2016, I. Uh, dove a little bit deeper into Bitcoin and like the other coins as well at that time. And uh, at that time, Bitcoin was around for six years. Uh, it went through like the Silk Road Mangox collapse. Uh, it uh, had two bear markets at the time under its belt. So it seemed like it's staying around uh, and it just started to make, make sense for me. And at that time, uh, Trezor, the hardware wallet, uh, was uh, already invented. And one of the first like crypto gigs I had was analyzing sales for Trezor in 2015. Uh, so it started all started to click together. And I started to gradually move away from like being a gold bug to becoming a Bitcoiner. Yeah, but it took me uh, several years more to like actually have the proper conviction and uh, not to be scared away during the bear markets. Yeah, and uh, yeah, well, uh, 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 yeah, as I'm sure you can appreciate, it takes uh, anyone that's new to crypto, they need to go through uh, a cycle to really understand, uh, yeah, what is that, what that is like, and how they can build the conviction to be able to stay the course and, and last the distance and not get shaken out and uh, hopefully do better in, in the next cycle. You also said, um, and I relate to this, you know, when most people uh, encounter or hear about Bitcoin for the first time um, yeah it doesn't usually have much of an impact on on most people you know you need to you need to encounter it two three or four times uh, or if you're really lucky maybe you have someone that will really sit you down and, and give you a good talking to uh, that has happened to many of us um, but uh, you know Joseph what is uh, you know I just interested the the kind of people that are um, learning uh, studying or even teaching uh, Austrian economics uh, in your part of the world, you know, have they come round to Bitcoin uh, more and more? I understand that you know that potentially there be a, a long history of uh, gold bugs, as you call it, uh, within those communities. But um, are they crossing over in, into Bitcoin more and more as well now? Well, yeah, most of them, uh, most of them are. For example, I um, cooperate partially with the Students for Liberty, which is a students' movement. It's from the United States, uh, but it's very active in Czech Republic and Europe as well. And a lot of uh, like the talks and uh, the discussion panels and stuff on uh, their events uh, at their conferences are focused around Bitcoin. Uh, like this year, there was a LibertyCon in Prague, uh, a huge international conference, and um, Stefan Vivar was there. Uh, George Selgin, of course, we discussed with him. Like he's sort of a skeptic, uh, but uh, like very, uh, very objective in his critiques. And yeah, it was a, it, it was a, these were good discussions, and uh, they are very, very much uh, steered in the direction of Austrian economics and both 
uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and yeah, I've seen this uh, with many other uh, like Austrian economists, uh, for example, there used to be uh, Ludwig von Mises Institute in Czech Republic. I was actually one of the co-founder and everybody who was part of the Ludwig von Mises Institute is now a Bitcoiner. Uh, I know that uh, not all Austrian economists and libertarians uh, are on board with Bitcoin. Uh, the famous example being Peter Schiff, of course, uh, but he's yes. quite an exception. Like I respect him for all the work he's done uh around uh the great recession 2008 2010 he had like great uh talks at the time and i uh, followed him quite a lot at the time but he sort of didn't make like the final step uh and i don't know if he will <laughs> ever make it at this point uh and he's become a sort of like a cartoon character now uh but he's quite an exception like i little uh, i meet a lot of uh like gold bucks and i don't mean it in a bit bad way like that's just the term uh like i meet a lot of gold uh, proponents and usually they are sympathetic to bitcoin they usually hold some bitcoin uh usually these people are slightly older than my age but uh they are quite open to uh to uh this narrative because like for the 95 percent of the way we say the same things we need to return to the sound money there's something very wrong with the fiat currencies uh and where we slightly differ is like what's the final step like is it returning to gold and silver and how you would actually manage that or is it adopting this new thing that may seem untried from the perspective of someone who's been around for uh, like 60 years and for the past 40 years, he's been like uh, interested in these ideas. Then of course, Bitcoin seems like a new thing. And I totally understand there are skeptics. Yes, well, I mean, the correct um, mental framework to assess new technology often is uh, to be sceptic, but, you know, you've also got to remain open to new possibilities. And, of course, you know, the, the big difference between Bitcoin and gold, uh, Yosef, is, well, I mean, there are a number of differences, but um, but one of the ones that strikes me, of course, is that in the last 10 years, uh, the price of gold is roughly um, the same as it was 10 years years ago uh, when measured yeah. against the US dollar, whereas uh, Bitcoin has uh, appreciate, significantly appreciated uh, in the last 10 years, certainly had uh, a lot of volatility uh, along the way, but that's that's what you'd expect when uh, a new asset class is in the process of uh, financialization, right, Yosef? Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. That's, uh, that's exactly right. And I guess if uh, gold was discovered as a new element and uh, went through this process of monetization, it will be the same. Like you cannot uh, bootstrap from zero to global monetary standard, uh, like in a straight line, uh, to, to a straight line up, you know, uh, it's going to be volatile. It's traded 24 seven all around the world. There is a lot of like human psychology involved, a lot of uh, speculative capital. And of course, uh, like the monetary policy, the money printing, the easy money policy that, of course, uh, uh, drives a lot of speculative capital into Bitcoin as well. So we see these uh, uh, maniac bull markets that are followed by uh, like steep drops. Uh, and that's usually because of there are a lot of uh, speculants in, this, in the space. And uh, that's why uh, the corrections, the bear markets are quite healthy for Bitcoin and for the whole space, because uh, uh, as we say, Bitcoin then moves from the weak hands to the strong hands, from the tourists, from the speculants to the hodlers and to people like me and you who understand the long term proposition. So, yeah, I actually think bear markets are good for Bitcoin. And where do you think we are, Joseph, in terms of, uh, I suppose, uh, that, um, I don't know, you know, Bitcoin adoption uh, journey, uh, call it whatever you want. You know, there's different ways of, of measuring these things, you know, uh, you know, technology adoption, S-curves, all that sort of stuff. Of course, the, you know, the on-chain analytics in terms of, you know, new wallets and uh, there's always uh, see that we're reaching new all-time highs in terms of new wallets holding uh, 
0.1 BTC uh, and more. Um, how do you think uh, about that kind of stuff? Are we, uh, f- you know, further along that journey uh, than you would have expected, or do we still have uh, decades and decades uh, to go before we reach, if not hyper Bitcoinization, um, you know, some kind of uh, mass adoption event? Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um... I think we are moving uh, faster than I imagined, like around 2015. Uh, And part of that is uh, the Lightning Network that helps uh, quite a lot. Uh, And let's let's just go back in history and like realize that in the 2017 bull market, there was no Lightning Network. The first public Lightning Network transaction was done in 2018, and it took maybe another two years until Lightning Network was actually usable by ordinary people. And uh, there were like nice usable wallets that may be custodian, but uh, still for small uh, amounts, they are usable like Wallet of Satoshi uh, and Phoenix and Moon. But of course, these are not uh, custodial, but they are like really usable for people and you can finally find the routes you don't have as, as many problems with uh, payments going through so lightning network helped quite a lot in the adoption and uh what finally happened is what bitcoiners have been like calling for since like 2015 is bitcoin is actually being adopted in uh the poor countries in the countries where they needed the most because uh, their monetary systems work uh, work the worst they are they are the worst so uh, as I said, I do these Twitter spaces, uh, mostly with people from like poor and developing countries from uh, the global south. And uh, I've been very surprised how Bitcoin is, uh, how far Bitcoin adoption has gone in countries like Argentina, Venezuela, Cuba. Uh, f- yeah, it's, it's really moving at a very fast pace. Lightning Network is a big part of that. And of course, um, the, like the legal tender adoption of El Salvador and Central African Republic. Um, it's controversial, but it helps a lot uh, with like the legitimacy of Bitcoin. Since uh, Bitcoin is being now adopted by the nation states, uh, this is something I didn't imagine is going to happen in 2021 or 22. Like uh, it seems like it's uh, quite soon <laughs> and let's see where it, where it goes. Uh, but it already happened and like now they are going to be like the third and fourth and fifth country and uh, it's uh, just going to spread like a domino. It, like the third country can take like maybe a couple of years now, but it's not going to be decades. And central banks are taking Bitcoin much more seriously. Uh, if you actually check out like some uh, studies that are uh, that are uh, being published in like central bank bulletins, uh, they are very no- knowledgeable uh and they don't dismiss it anymore like they did like five years ago so basically in all the metrics uh bitcoin is being adopted i would say at a much faster pace than i would imagine several years ago Yes, I, I very much agree with that, Yosef. And, uh, you know, because if we think just back uh, a year ago last year, <clears throat> of course, it was a bull market. But, you know, it was in- incredible when you think back now, we had the likes of, you know, Elon Musk and Tesla uh, out of nowhere buying a, a whole lot of Bitcoin. And then, yeah, the first nation state, El Salvador, uh, buying Bitcoin and, and making uh, Bitcoin legal tender. And, you know, it really did feel like... Uh, uh, global adoption was starting to happen and I suppose uh, you know it, it is but of course it's you know two steps forward one step back uh, now we've uh, now we've got to uh, yeah experience a bit of the the bear market and everyone's got to uh, uh, go underwater a little bit on their positions certainly <laughs> Tesla and, and El Salvador but that is part of the process um, let's switch gears slightly Joseph we'll come we'll come back uh, later in the show and just kind of touch back on to uh, hyper bitcoinization which is always fun but um yeah trezor so this is this is a little bit interesting um 
since we're talking to you, love to understand a little bit about, um, yeah, the, the work that, that Trezor is doing in terms of, um, yeah, h- hardware wallets and how, uh, how, yeah, what is the, what is the hardware wallet uh, scene like at the moment? Because it's a funny one as well. You know, I'm sure as a kind of hardcore Bitcoiner, you'll be very much a not your keys, not your coins uh, kind of a person, which I can appreciate. But the flip side of that, of course, also is if we are encouraging this, you know, uh, widespread uh, mass adoption, Lightning Network, being able to buy uh, McDonald's and coffee with your Bitcoin, fantastic. Um, But, you know, can we really uh, trust mums, grandmas, granddads? Uh, are they really um, responsible enough? Can we can we expect them to uh, be responsible enough to not lose uh, their seed phrases, private keys, that kind of stuff? Well, yeah, that's uh, that's a great question, and we've been thinking a lot about like uh, how self custody is going to work for like the next several hundred million people. Uh, Admittedly, uh, there's this, like there's an obstacle with Bitcoin because you cannot have like a billion uh, separate UTXOs. It's basically not technically and economically feasible. So we need Lightning Network, and we need probably some kind of uh, shared custody kind of thing, like uh, for example, what the Bitcoin Beach is doing, uh, and the Bitcoin Beach Wallet. It's uh, quite an interesting project. And lately, there has been a lot of talk about uh, Fedimint, uh, the Chromium eCash system, and the Fedi Wallet. And we've been in talks with uh, with the, some of the Fedimint uh, proponents. And this may seem like the way to go. It's uh, probably going to take some time still, uh, but like in general, uh, l- like most people won't have like sufficient savings to justify having like an on-chain UTXO uh, secured by their hardware wallet. That's just a fact around how the wealth is distributed around the world at that at this time at this point uh, in ta- of time. Uh, so. Like the Lightning Network wall, uh, wallet, where they control their own keys, at least, that might be sufficient for uh, like the next several hundred million people. With the caveat uh, that if these people like save up sufficient amounts to like justify having an on-chain UTXO, which should be at least one million satoshis, uh, because if you're looking forward, you 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 should uh, count on uh, transaction fees getting much higher, and then probably it wouldn't be economical to have uh, UTXOs below one million satoshi. Uh, and one million satoshi right now is around two hundred dollars, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's around two hundred dollars. Uh, in the future, is going to be much more. So. Uh, not a lot of people will have like several thousands of dollars worth of savings. So yeah, uh, I sort of like uh, now uh, got lost into in uh, these thoughts. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like uh, on-chain Bitcoin uh, self custody isn't as scalable as we would like. That's that's for sure. So we need to work with uh, the lightning network maybe with some side chains like liquid and with like this shared custody model of the fediment and we are looking both into lightning network and into fediment uh, to understand how hardware wallets may like uh, what's the role of hardware wallets in, in these areas uh, until now we didn't have to really like uh, solve for this problem because uh, there are around, I believe, 80 million UTXOs now in Bitcoin, and that's fine. Uh, and just a fraction of those, like just a couple of million of those, actually have hardware wallets, right? Uh, I would say uh, there are maybe 10 million total hardware wallets around the world at this point. So it hasn't been a problem so far, like for Bitcoiners to have their own UTXOs and securing them with hardware wallets if they want. But looking for like five, 10 years into the future, if now we have like half a billion people 
in Bitcoin, uh, there's probably not going to be half a billion separate UTXOs. And these people uh, like shouldn't hold their coins on an exchange. That's like uh, the first uh, solution that you can have like these large custodians and they have, let's say, 10 UTXOs for 1000 people, right? Because uh, all the trades on that exchange are just uh, accounting stuff. They don't really move the UTXOs. They only do that when they need to consolidate, when they accept uh, deposits and uh, process withdrawals, right? So they don't, they are like banks. They are, slight, they are like what Halfine described in like 2010, like the Bitcoin banks. Uh, but that sort of solution is very dangerous for Bitcoin adoption and for Bitcoiners because these are single points of failure. Uh, the accounts can be hacked. The exchanges themselves can be hacked. They can be regulated. Uh, they can have your accounts uh, frozen. Uh, they can cancel or uh, totally dismiss withdrawals and stuff. So we need to find another model. And I guess like uh, the layers on top of Bitcoin like Lightning Network and the shared custody uh, stuff like the Fediment is probably the way to go. It's the way to go uh, without compromising on like the cypherpunk ideals of Bitcoin. Absolutely. And uh, what, what about um, what's, in, what's in the product pipeline at, at Trezor uh, then, uh, Yosef? Is, is there anything uh, that you can share in terms of uh, are there like new hardware wallet models uh, that are, um, I don't know, maybe just uh, more, more user friendly or um, a little bit slicker? I'm sure that uh, you guys are working on them. I'm sure Ledger are doing the same thing. When can we expect a new product? Yeah, sure. So, uh, like the notable uh, improvements in Trezor, uh, last year we launched uh, the Trezor Suite, the uh, like uh, accompanying app to Trezor, uh, and we've been able to roll out uh, improvements due to the Trezor Suite, uh, like uh, uh, much faster since then. So, for example, one of uh, the like interesting improvements is you can now connect your full node uh, to your Trezor via Electrum server uh, straight from the Trezor suite. Uh, next week, I don't know when this will be uh, aired, but by but uh, by the middle of August, we are gonna have uh, Satoshi units in Trezor suite. So far, we had only uh, like full Bitcoin denominations, which uh, can be quite a lot and uh, that you see like all the decimals. So we are moving uh, to the option of users uh, having the ability to switch to set Satoshis. Uh, and I personally welcome that because uh, uh, my mental model is I calculate everything in Satoshis, not in full Bitcoins anymore. Uh, and yeah, we have the Bitcoin only firmware uh, since around 2019. But it was quite uh, hard to uh, install on Trezor <laughs> for some time. So uh, now, finally, we have managed to make uh, the Bitcoin-only firmware uh, much more accessible. And you will actually have the, uh, uh, the option to install the Bitcoin-only firmware straight from the Trezor suite, just a couple of clicks. And that's going to be out in uh, mid-August. So I guess Bitcoiners should welcome these developments. And what's what's next for Trezor is uh, we will roll out uh, the coin control. And that's uh, like the first step to having a coin join in, uh, in Trezor. Uh, we will roll out uh, the native mobile app because uh, the connectivity to mobiles has been sort of troublesome for Trezor. So we are rolling out uh, a native app for Android. Uh, yeah, and we are working on new models and uh, yeah, H1 2023, we should see a new Trezor model. Okay. And yeah, uh, uh, as you say, like a uh, sleeker design, it's going to be a, a bit nicer <laughs> than current models. Uh, and yeah, there are going to be like a lot of UX improvements. Uh, We've learned a lot uh, since like the first model in, in 2014 and our second model, Model T, uh, has been around since 2018. So uh, yeah, it's been another four years 
uh, it's time for a new model and uh, yeah the improvements are going to be uh, quite uh, quite quite nice uh, like there's going to be USB-C connectivity uh, better display uh, and yeah just uh, you'll see you'll see all right well uh, very exciting so uh, first half of next year yeah Love it. All right. Well, I said we'd talk a little bit about hyper Bitcoinization, uh, Yosef. So uh, let's finish off this part of the podcast by doing uh, just that, because you wrote a piece called The Hyper Bitcoinized World. Am I saying that right? I think I am. The Hyper Bitcoinized yeah. World. Yes. Uh, which is published. I'll put a link in the show notes, listeners, but it's published on uh, the btctimes.com. Um, so most people probably know what hyper Bitcoinization is, but uh, you write that it is a voluntary transition from an inferior currency to a superior one. I'm not sure if it's always voluntary, is it? Um, anyway, will you please take over, Yosef? Um, what? Uh, tell us a little bit more about, uh, in your view, what hyper Bitcoinization is, and also, you know, the kind of pathways to get there, uh, what they look like, and the kind of timelines uh, that you think um, uh, are rational and viable. Oh yeah, sure. So uh, the quote that hyper Bitcoinization is a voluntary transition from an inferior currency to a superior one, that's from Daniel Kravish uh, of the Nakamoto Institute. And he actually coined the term hyper Bitcoinization, Daniel. Yes. And it's been in 2014 already, which is uh, like crazy ahead of its time <laughs> that in 2014, uh, which was quite a, uh, quite a major bear market at that time. Uh, Daniel and Pierre Rochard at the time as well were thinking about like uh, hyper Bitcoinization. Uh, it seemed totally crazy <laughs> at the time, and it's it uh, seems seems crazy uh, even nowadays. So yeah, what uh, hyper Bitcoinization is and how it should uh, come about. Um, when we look at like the monetary policy of Bitcoin versus fiat currency, we can see that it's total opposites. Uh, we see ever more steeper uh, rate of money printing in fiat currencies like dollars, euros, check crowns, whatever. And we see the, the very opposite with Bitcoin. We have halvings and like the monetary inflation uh, is getting lower and lower every four years. So the clash between these monetary policies is uh, like the spark for hyper Bitcoinization. It's uh, the realization that uh, the fiat doesn't work as a long term store of value. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to save your hard earned money in fiat. It makes much more sense. And as time goes by, it's uh, even more obvious to save in Bitcoin. And hyper Bitcoinization is basically just. Uh, uh, just the cumulative effect of uh, people deciding to save in Bitcoin and later to uh, try to earn in Bitcoin, request like payments in Bitcoin, and then also to transact in Bitcoin. And personally, um, I sort of dislike the term hyper Bitcoinization because it's, it, it was inspired by hyperinflation. And hyperinflation is this like very rapid change in the economy, not very uh, pleasant, of course. And hyper Bitcoinization sort of seems like the same, like that's going to be something drastic. Uh, and a lot of people are going to lose uh, a lot of their money. There's going to be like a lot of um, welfare distribution. And I don't really like this term. What I like more is just by Bitcoinization. And this is what's actually happening right now in uh, places like Salvador and uh, some African countries as well, and like communities, like Bitcoin communities in uh, the Western countries as well. And so it can be like gradual, uh, doesn't have to be like this fierce uh, point in time where everything just sort of changes. Uh, but it's going to happen in the end. And uh, like Parker Lewis says, it's going to happen gradually, then suddenly. So at some point, there's going to be the point of no return where uh, like the game of musical chairs sort of stops. And whoever holds fiat currency at that point is going to 
uh, be in a quite a, quite a bad place. So that's probably going to happen. Um, but it can be much more civil and, as Daniel says, voluntary, at least at the arrow phases, than hyperinflation and what have you. So, uh, and yeah, uh, as I mentioned in the article, like the Bitcoinization is a form of currency substitution. And we have seen uh, currency substitu substitutions uh, in the 20th century uh, with dollarization usually, uh, where countries adopted dollars. And this is still happening in some countries, like, uh, for example, I visit Belarus every year because of my family. And in Belarus, they have their own like national currency. But most people don't really save in the currency and they don't like think in the currency. They think in dollars and they save in dollars. So there are countries that are effectively dollarized bottom up without the government basically acknowledging this uh, currency substitution. And the same thing is gradually happening with Bitcoin. Or for example, Nigeria is the country that has uh, the largest uh, share of Bitcoiners in the world. Uh, where around like 20 or 30 percent of the population uh, in some form use Bitcoin or stable coins or cryptocurrencies. And the government and the central bank are basically opposed to that, but they cannot do much about it. So uh, the Bitcoinization is sort of like a bottom-up process and uh, probably in the future is going to uh, come like uh, the point of hyper-Bitcoinization uh, but the society will be prepared for it, I believe. And if you want, we can go into like, um, what are the consequences of hyper-Bitcoinization, but depends on how much time we have. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, I, I like the way you frame it, Yosef, in, in the article, you talk about how in the short term, um, the beginning of Bitcoinization, if you like, it's just a, a handful of countries have officially adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. Uh, individuals and companies with an understanding of what is to come, they have already begun to live, live on a Bitcoin standard. And you say that here in 2022, we are still a few years away before this uh, era is beginning. Uh, but then in the long Long term, of course, uh, the vast majority of the world is hyper Bitcoinized. Uh, fiat remains a curious historical footnote, perhaps with a couple of backward nations uh, still clinging to it. And I guess the context here is, you know, it took 20 years for the first country to embark on its way to uh, Bitcoinization. We'll take a, a few more years for the second. Uh, but then the dominoes start to fall uh, and, uh, you know, nation states will, will quickly realize that the longer they wait, the more the more they lose out, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. And uh, I believe there are uh, countries or central banks that are already purchasing Bitcoin into their balance sheet without uh, talking about it publicly. Like. Uh, for example, uh, what we've seen in Iran is uh, the central bank actually imposed a requirement for the miners to sell off Bitcoin to the central bank, and they probably hold on to it, right? So they sort of like uh, understand uh, like that uh, the monetary paradigm is sort of shifting. And I believe uh, it's countries like these uh, like the sanctioned regimes, uh, the poor countries, the dollarized countries with their, their own uh, currencies, the CFA regime countries in Africa, that are going to be the first Bitcoinized countries. It's not going to be Germany or Czech Republic or England or United States. It's going to be countries like Salvador and Central African Republic and uh, countries like that. So, uh, and, and like one of the interesting consequences of that is uh, the global power is maybe going to shift a bit uh, towards the south because uh, they have the um, the advantage of being able to leapfrog our financial systems since the uh, it never worked for them uh, they can leapfrog the whole fiat system straight into bitcoin and i believe this is what we will see uh, this decade yeah, fascinating. And well, that's, um, yeah, it's just how that's how game theory works. <laughs> yeah, the, yep. you have a natural advantage if, if you get in early and uh, start stacking those sets uh, on the down low, maybe not telling people and then, 
Yeah, boom. All right, well, let's go to uh, a very quick break, and then we will come back. We'll finish off. We'll have some fun. Uh, we'll run Yosef through the very famous crypto conversation, Hot Take Ground. In today's crypto market, the team at Brave New Coin are the sector's leading builders of custom crypto indices. BNC's powerful indexing engine draws on Brave New Coin's premium data to calculate high frequency intraday and end of day indices for a wide range of index products. BNC's custom indices help you to gain exposure to the crypto assets class and track your performance against the market without having to become a stock picker. Not sure what you need? A Brave New Coin consultant can help you assess your requirements. Contact BNC today to find out more. All right, we are back, and I'm with uh, Yosef Tetek. He is uh, the brand ambassador and Bitcoin analyst at Satoshi Labs, who make the Trezor hardware wallets. And uh, as you've heard, Yosef is a longtime Bitcoiner. He has a background in Austrian economics. He's an author. He's a writer. He's a Bitcoiner, basically. Yosef, I like to finish each podcast with a quick round of rapid-fire crypto conversation hot takes. Are you up for it? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Let's go. I'm just going to run some questions at you, Yosef. Just want uh, hot take answers, quick snappy answers, but um, yeah, just no right or wrong way to do it. Question one is, where would you say you sit on the Bitcoin maximalist uh, to multi-chain opportunist spectrum? Yeah, I'm a total Bitcoin maximalist. No surprise there. All right. Well, what would you say is your firmest conviction, a Bitcoin opinion? Uh, that we will never change the 21 million limit. There are uh, people like Peter Todd saying we need the tail emission. I believe that's not going to happen ever. And uh, uh, yeah, Bitcoin is the 21 million uh, cap. I love it. Yep. All right. Well, uh, you know, Joseph, Bill Gates famously said we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. So, you know, whatever you like here, but uh, Bitcoin, uh, what does it all look like in 10 years time? Uh, I guess nobody can say, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's going to be much better in all its aspects. Uh, uh, and the least important of those maybe is the price, but the price will follow the developments around the world. Uh, fiat currency is not going to improve and Bitcoin is going to improve in all its aspects. So yeah, it's quite clear for me. Uh, I will be quite afraid to have any fiat exposure in 10 years. And I'm quite afraid to have any fiat exposure right now. I love it. What about the you know the Bitcoin uh, fee market uh, issue? Do you see uh, how do you see that uh, resolving itself uh, over time? Yeah, I believe uh, the fees uh, need to climb much higher in the, uh, over time. That's why I always uh, recommend people to have UTXOs of at least one million satoshis because uh, in time we can see uh, fees climbing up to like. 10, 20, 50,000 satoshis per transaction. So yeah, keep that in mind, uh, consolidate your UTXO with uh, the privacy aspect uh, on your mind as well. Uh, yeah, but that's going to happen. That's just how Bitcoin is supposed to work and how Bitcoin needs to work. The fees need to be much higher. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, William Gibson said that uh, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. With that in mind, Joseph, can you think of an example of the future being here right now, but most people aren't really aware of it? I would say that's Lightning Network. Uh, the ability to just send value to anyone in the world at any time, 24-7, with very neg negligible fees, uh, no need for inter intermediary, no need for permission, that's that's the future it's amazing and most people aren't aware of that absolutely all right time to zoom out time to get weird just for a second what do you see as the long-term future for the human race do you see dystopia or utopia i see utopia uh if we fix the money we will fix the world i quite believe that because uh money uh permits everything and it's like 50 percent of everything we do uh so we need to fix the money and I'm I'm quite optimistic about the future. I'm a fan of Hans Rosling and Johan Norberg 
and I very recommend uh, reading their thoughts on uh, like the future and the progress of humanity and of course uh, Matt Ridley as well. I'm a rational optimist. I believe uh, if you learn about economics, especially Austrian economics, if you are libertarian at least in some, uh, in some way, you have to be an optimist. Absolutely. I love it. Uh, makes sense to me. Rational optimism is the best way to be. Um, we reached the end of the show, really, Joseph. The final question is, uh, what is your favorite science fiction book, film, or TV show? All right. Uh, so I just finished the Hichi Saga, uh, and I don't remember the name of the author, but uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. And yeah, the, the other one is The Free Body Problem by Lixin, uh, Lixin Liu. Uh, I, I, I'm bad with the names, but uh, The Free Body Problem is probably one of the best uh, sci-fi I've ever read. Yes, it is. The, um, by the, the Chinese author, correct? Yeah. 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 All right. Well, um, thank you for that. Thank you, Joseph. Have enjoyed talking to you. Uh, really looking forward to more news, detail and announcements on uh, uh, that Trezor hardware wallet new model expected in the first half of next year. And uh, perhaps we'll check in with you, uh, Joseph, uh, in another year or two and we'll see uh, how what the path to hyper-Bitcoinization is looking like. But uh, that is it for today. Please close it out by telling the people where they can go to find Find you on Twitter or wherever else you like to hang out and uh, what they should do to uh, yeah just find out what you guys are doing at Satoshi Labs and so on yeah sure so the best place to find me and my work is at Twitter I am at uh, Seth Joseph and yeah please follow the Trezor account as well because that's where we host uh, the Twitter spaces uh, and publish stuff like uh, for our blog and stuff. So uh, yeah, follow Seth, Joseph and Trezor on Twitter and we'll find out everything about what we do. Awesome. Thank you, Yosef. All the best and bye for now. Thank you. Thanks. All right, that was Yosef uh, from Satoshi's Labs. Yes, always fun talking to a hardcore Bitcoiner. Um, yeah, and Yosef was a hardcore Bitcoiner, wasn't he? Love it. Love it. Uh, good stuff. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Oh, and of course, you know, shout out to Yosef for uh, the three body problem. How many times have people come on this show and recommended the three body problem? And when they do, I always say, oh, you're the 10th person <laughs> to recommend that. And I always say, I must read it. But I still haven't read it. Gosh, I must. Do you know what I'm reading at the moment? I'm actually reading um, Steve Jobs' autobiography. I've read it before. I read it when it came out 10 years ago. But um, yeah, no, I just picked it up again and um, flying through it. But God, it's good. Uh, yeah, Steve Jobs. What a legend. He's a bit of a dick, to be fair, as well. But man, what a legend. Um, interesting. If you hadn't read that, you should highly recommend. Anyway... I'm off to find <laughs> a translation of the three-body problem. Mm. That was today's show, folks. Thanks for listening. This was the Crypto Conversation for Brave New Guy.